does it always move every goddamn time? What do there? Oh. Okay. Right. Let's try this. Okay. Hey there, folks. Dan Fritter here again with Galbra Magazine. I'm doing another video with a quick follow up. Um, for you eagle eyed folks out there, you'll know this is the same day. It is also like crazy hot. So if I look really tired, it's because it's about probably 34 degrees in this garage right now and about 40 degrees outside of my backyard. So it's a uh, hasse muy color. Um, so another video that I wanted to do and follow up to that previous one about uh, the Dan Force shooting and where we go from here. Uh, what gun owners can do is actually, this is not a preachy video, it's just an interesting kind of informative one about uh, the Danforth shooting and, and how it kind of provides in its own way evidence that we probably should look at firearms laws, but not in the way that people are talking about. Um, so what do we know about it? Obviously in the Danforth situation, we had an unlicensed individual who was in illegal possession of a firearm, right? Gun stolen from somewhere in Saskatchewan, apparently. There's also been reports was smuggled out of the States and I'm not really sure which of those is true, but whichever one doesn't really matter. One of the common things people have brought up is that uh, this case is evidence that we need harsher penalties for those that commit crimes with firearms. And that sounds great. It really does. I mean, you can imagine that if a, an armed robber was um, going to face a much higher sentence if they used a firearm, they might be swayed away from using a firearm. There's some logic to that. However, um, that's not going to work. And that's not going to work because the Supreme Court of Canada actually had a case about mandatory minimum sentences as they pertain to firearms crime. Um, and I think it's really important. I'm just going to grab my phone and pull it up so you guys can find the case. Uh, it is R versus NUR, N-U-R, uh, and it dates from 2015. It involves um, two people convicted of uh, possession of a prohibited firearm, or prohibited firearms, I think. I haven't read the full thing. It's incredibly long, and I'm not a lawyer, so I just don't, I don't play like that. Um, however, in the reasons for judgment at the Supreme Court, and the case is interesting because the two people involved brought the case forward not because they felt their sentences were overly harsh, but because they felt the mandatory minimum sentences of, I believe it was five years for a firearms offense such as theirs, uh, constituted cruel and unusual punishment, which is section 12 of the Charter of Rights and Freedoms, if I recall correctly. Section 12 of something. Um, and it's interesting because they weren't bringing this up in their own situation because of the extenuating circumstances of their cases. What's also interesting is that the Supreme Court justices decided that five years as a mandatory minimum sentence for possession of a prohibited firearm or of a firearm under Section 95. So let's backtrack a bit. So Section 95 of the Criminal Code uh, states the part that pertains to licensing. You must have a license for a firearm. It does relate to prohibited firearms because you can have a prohibited license, obviously. So simply possession of a prohibited firearm is not necessarily as damning as it sounds but it does come down to a licensing issue. The Supreme Court justices decided that a five-year mandatory, mandatory, mandatory minimum for a prohibited firearm as it related to the licensing side of things constituted cruel and unusual punishment in many cases because the majority of cases they expected to see or that they would infer could possibly be seen by the courts would relate to people whose licenses had lapsed or people with no ill will or violent defense that you know perhaps live in a rural area and were never aware of the licensing program having come into existence. So we've got a situation now where the Canadian Firearms Act and, and licensing itself is effectively a hindrance to passing stiffer sentences on firearms crime because the Supreme Court recognized that the act itself is so, well, this isn't in their reasons for judgment, but the inference that I make from reading it is that the act itself is so nebulously worded that it can accidentally catch up a whole lot of people um, that don't deserve the heavier sentences that would normally be associated with firearms crime. Um, and it doesn't allow, you know, if you were in this case, you know, if you're in possession of a firearm illegally and you shoot 16 people on a street, that is obviously a different crime than if you're in possession of a firearm and it's on your farm and you've just never had a pal because you never really needed one. However, in the eyes of the law, the offense is the offense. The extenuating circumstances all play into that, but it's very difficult to build a mandatory minimum sentencing protocol when you can have these varied sort of situations at play. So I think it's an interesting little piece of uh, firearms history and one that, again, you know, kind of highlights the notion that perhaps the Firearms Act needs to be opened up and re-examined because in the situation as R versus NUR, 
near, it's a strange name. Uh, the act itself uh, cannot be applied adequately to those to whom it should probably apply the most harsh. So, harshly, harshest. You'd think of someone that writes a lot, I'd know this stuff, but um, yeah, so take a look for it. It's obviously widely available, and uh, I think it's something that's worthy of discussion. Hopefully again, you guys enjoyed this video, and uh, look for another one soon, maybe later this week, hopefully. But yeah, anyways, stay safe, and uh, see you guys soon.